our, our formal, we are halfway through this year's JROST event, uh, the Joint Roadmap of Open Science Tools. Um, for those of you who might be newly joining, that you should probably know who I am by now, just in case. Um, I'm Caitlin Thaney. I'm the Executive Director of Invest in Open Infrastructure. Uh, we are a project that actually came out of the first JROS conference in 2018. And so it's really um, exciting to be joining you all and to be helping to organize this year's event. So before we get into our panel, and then we've got a number of uh, breakouts and some lighting talks tonight, just uh, some housekeeping. Uh, I wanted to start with the uh, land acknowledgement. Um, I know that this is a virtual event, but we wish to acknowledge that this conference, while virtual, um, is starting situated upon the traditional, ancestral, and unceded land of the Muncie Lenape and Canarsie people, where I'm based here in New York City. Um, we pay respect to the elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. This acknowledgement demonstrates our commitment to working to dismantle the systems of oppression that have displaced indigenous peoples and the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Uh, we will share a link in the, uh, the J. Rostin IOI Slack as well, that if you're interested in finding out what territory and land uh, you might be on, you can find out more information there. In terms of housekeeping, in case this is your first time using Zoom, uh, we ask that you click on the top right-hand corner of your video. Um, there should be three dots that are there um, that allow you to rename or change the, the naming settings. Um, and just make sure that it says your first and last name. You can add your project affiliation as well, which I recognize I need to add my own. Um, and if you'd like to add any preferred pronouns, um, you can do that as well. For Q&A for the main panel, um, please use the Zoom chat to ask any questions for the panelists. I'll be working with the program committee to curate those questions so that we can um, make sure that those get asked or as many of them as possible. We also have in the Slack that you all have been invited to a couple of designated places for discussion. So there's designated rooms for lightning talks for later. Um, there's a JROS 2020 chatter room if you have any sort of additional conversation. And you can also ask questions in the conference chat. Um, but we do ask that you, during the main panel tonight, keep the Zoom chat for those main questions and comments. Timekeeping um, reminders will be posted in Zoom chat for those who are leaving sessions a little bit later on. And also timekeeping for myself. And if you have any questions, we do have a designated Slack channel um, for help desk there too. So feel free, we have members of our program committee who are monitoring that and we'll be there to answer any of your questions. In terms also of creating a safe and inclusive environment, um, we are committed to making sure that this is an enjoyable and harassment free zone for everyone who is participating in these discussions for the next few days. Um, our event safety team includes my colleague Vanessa Reinsmith from UCLA. Uh, who is face muted, but would otherwise wave. Um, Danielle Robinson from Code for Science and Society and myself. Um, you can reach us and also access our um, Code of Conduct in the Code of Conduct channel in Slack. And we can also share that link out too. Um, feel free to reach out to any of us if you um, would like to have a conversation about something that make, makes you feel uncomfortable or might be in violation of our Code of Conduct. Um, there's also a place where you can report anonymously if you feel more comfortable there. And then additionally, we will be recording this meeting, including the breakouts and the lightning talks. Um, meeting recordings will be made available in January. Um, or I'm not even going to promise that those will be out this week. So um, we will have those in the new year available on the IOI website. Um, if you have any questions or want to flag something that you want to have you know not be recorded please let the event organizers know um, or your session hosts and, and use your own discretion um, we're, we're happy to help but also recognize that um, we do want to make this as open and transparent as possible and part of the reason that we're having these two distinct chunks of time for programming each day is so we can accommodate as many time zones as possible. So we know that there's um, individuals who will be tuning in to these sessions um, after, after the time. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And let's see, we're going to get um, over and into our <coughs> panel. So Vanessa, if you wouldn't mind spotlighting our panelists, we can segue right on over. Okay. And then Caitlin, do you want me to spotlight you or are you good? Your choice, Vanessa, your choice. We just, it's such like nice, it's like four squares. It's very, it goes well with Perfect. my OCD. Let's keep it. Maybe we'll Let's go with it. that. Perfect. Let's keep 
um, so segueing into our um, our kind of second panel of the day, we had one this morning that was focused on funders funding infrastructure. We had a number of perspectives um, from individuals who are not just kind of meeting the current needs for open infrastructure for research and for scholarship with funding dollars, but actually taking measures to help, you know, build that technology. Um, we uh, are ecstatic. I am ecstatic to have the four uh, individuals with us here that I'll introduce in one moment join us because they all to me represent you know, kind of overlapping in certain ways, but also very different um, perspectives, especially this this past year or 18 months on issues of open digital infrastructure. Um, if, you know, there's ever been a year where infrastructure has been, um, infrastructure has been discussed in earnest, uh, it has been this year. And I know from starting this job this past March, uh, I could have never uh, imagined so many rich conversations around infrastructure, uh, but if there's ever a time, uh, a series of global crises will drive that home. And so this year we've seen the demand uh, for more attention, support and engagement around our shared digital public infrastructure um, in a number of different ways, be that in civil society, in libraries, archives, museums and galleries, in research, in education, you name it. Um, we've seen the dimensions around equity come to play and around who can access the infrastructure, who is it for, what does that enable and what systemic inequities do we need to as a community begin to address. We've also seen the economic uh, elements of funding and maintaining digital infrastructure as well as making that available come to light in new and profound ways as we've seen that understrained with the increase in demand for that in infrastructure and what it enables um, in overdrive while also seeing economic volatility that in my lifetime I've never seen before. Um, and so I'm really excited to have a conversation with these four panelists um, to hear not only about the work that they're all doing within uh, their portfolios, within their organizations and as individuals themselves around infrastructure and uh, then also get into some really deep conversations and, and questions around that too. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to do just a, a quick intro for our in the bedrooms. Sure. There we go. And if we could just mute everybody. That'd just come give me when you're ready to feed her. <laughs> J. Ross is also a place where everyone can bring their full selves, as we said last night. <laughs> so I love like, <laughs> you know, we all have those. You might you hear my neighbor outside and you also might hear my child in the background too. Okay, so hopping straight in. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce, I'll start with Laura. Uh, Laura Marr is a program manager at the Siegel Family Endowment. Um, she's been there since 2016. She's worked at the International Commission on Financing Global Education Opportunity. Um, the Education Commission is a global initiative to develop a renewed and compelling case and financing pathway for achieving equal educational opportunity for children and young people. Um, she also has worked at the World Bank, Brookings Institution, uh, and UNHCR, where she developed a framework for engagement around innovative tertiary learning. Um, Dario Terabrelli is uh, the is it technically the program officer for science or science officer, the equivalent at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, um, who's also supporting this event here. Um, Dario is a social computing researcher and open knowledge advocate uh, who's based in San Francisco and also a former colleague of mine from the Wikimedia Foundation uh, as the science officer for open science at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, his goal is to build programs and technology to support open, reproducible and accessible research. Um, prior to joining CZI, he was a director and head of research at the Wikimedia Foundation, um, the nonprofit that operates Wikipedia and its sister projects. Um, he also is a co-author of the Altmetrics Manifesto, a co-founder of the Initiative for Open Citations, um, and a long-standing open access advocate and friend in the space. Um, Patricia Swave is a program officer for public knowledge at the Mellon Foundation, um, which she joined in August 2016. Um, in that role, she works on a range of grants and initiatives um, supporting libraries, archives, museums, universities, presses, and other institutions to further the world's collective knowledge of the humanities. Um, previously, uh, Ms. Sway was digital content strategist and co-department head of publishing and curation services at Penn State University Libraries from 2010 to 2016. And at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, uh, the program manager from 2008 to 2009 for several digital preservation projects funded by the Library of Congress. Um, she began working in academic libraries as a council on library and information services, uh, CLEAR, as some of you may know, postdoctoral fellow. 
um, and also at the University of Illinois in 2004, the year that CLEAR launched that program. Um, Ms. Sway was, has also served as the in-house editor uh, for Brooklyn Clark Lehman, which I might have gotten pronunciation wrong, my apologies, the publisher of reference works in literary and social history, and has taught in the Russian department at Amherst College. Um, and we are thrilled to have her here. And then last but certainly not least, uh, we have Michael Brennan, who's a program officer at the Ford Foundation on the technology and society team. Um, he oversees a portfolio of grantees that globally address open internet issues through a technical lens and also helps to develop and manage a technology fellows program at the foundation. Michael has over 10 years of experience researching and advising both the private and public sector on technology policy. Uh, he co-founded the Privacy, Security, and Automation Lab at Drexel University, where he worked as a senior researcher. And during his tenure at Drexel, uh, he served as a technologist for the Federal Trade Commission's Division of Privacy and Identity Protection. Prior to joining the Ford Foundation in 2015, uh, he was an associate partner at Second Muse, an innovation strategy firm dedicated to finding collaborative solutions for large scale problems. Uh, he led their open innovation and internet freedom programs, as well as co-directed company operations. Um, his work there included developing global social impact technology communities with institutions such as NASA, Al Jazeera, creating a research framework um, for discovering the communication technology needs of communities around the globe and working with local communities and civil society organizations worldwide to provide technology-based innovations addressing issues from domestic violence to sustainable development. Ha, huh. it's a very, very uh, accolade-filled group here and we are very, very excited to have you here. Um, so to kick things off, so you don't just, you're not just hearing from me. I would love to start with some initial comments from each of you to tell me a little bit more and tell this group a little bit more about some of the work that you do around infrastructure and what that means. Laura, would you like to kick us off? Sure, yeah. Um, you know, like Caitlin said, I'm Laura Maher. I lead the appropriately named infrastructure portfolio at Siegel Endowment. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Siegel, we are a private foundation based in New York City, and we're really interested in how technology is reshaping society, specifically through our three areas of learning, workforce, and infrastructure. Um, so we came on the scene uh, around 2014, we had an initial focus on, you know, open research and open education. And then the further we started digging into the issues of sort of like what it would take to create an open knowledge infrastructure, we realized that there were all these other factors, both online and offline, um, that influenced the way that um, infrastructure took shape and the kind of world that we wanted to create. And so we've been working um, to promote a new framework for infrastructure that recognizes the interdependence, not just between the digital dimension, but also the physical and the social dimensions. And we really think that this um, you know, way of thinking for us is aligned with a lot of the modern realities of the world. So you know, when most of us think about infrastructure, we think about it in just one of those dimensions. I mean, the top thing that probably comes to mind is physical infrastructure, roads, bridges, ports, um, you know, as well as the public utilities like trains and, and sewage systems, electric grids, um, you know, all those things that make up the built world. Um, I know of, you know, particular importance to this group is the digital infrastructure, you know, the assets that enable some of those digital communications, the cell towers, the broadbands, the satellites, those kind of physical pieces, but also the data, the hardware, the software, and the coding that allows everything to function together. Um, or you might actually think of social infrastructure, which has become, um, I think, more spotlighted given the realities of the pandemic and sort of the lack thereof a lot of social infrastructure. Um, but it's the public institutions, those shared public spaces, the connections, the community organizations that shape the way that people are able to connect with one another and the kinds of supports they're able to enjoy, the kinds of wraparound life support. So, you know, while these three dimensions have, you know, are treated like separate issues, it doesn't really work like that in the real world. You know, if you think about a library, it's not just a physical storage facility for books. It, it offers digital connections, it offers internet access, it forges community bonds. You know, a road isn't just a paved surface for vehicles. It's a vital artery for commerce, for social connections. And, you know, increasingly it's governed just as much um, by digital systems like Google Maps and Waze as it is by individual drivers. So very multidimensional. Um, and when, you know, you post a comment on Twitter, or you join a Zoom like this one, uh, you know, you're relying on a vast network of these physical structures like the cell towers, the transatlantic cables, the server farms, as well as these invisible structures like radio signals and network protocols and coding. So, you know, for us, the way that we approach infrastructure is to see the reality of these dimensions influencing one another and recognizing, again, that interdependence if we're to get smart about infrastructure. So, you know, given this, this framework and this approach kind of on the horizon for our work at Siegel is, you know, figuring out how to work with our stakeholders, with our grantees, our network, fellow funders like um, 
my, my co-panelists here, you know, to figure out how to take forward this really, really high level concept. And so, you know, for us, um, when we think about our work, we look about, we look at it through, you know, four lenses of, you know, how do we define infrastructure? How do we design it better? How do we govern it? And then how do we fund it? And I know we're going to probably dive, touch upon all four of those areas during the course of this conversation today. Um, so why don't I, um, I'll stop there and just say that, um, you know, looking forward to the discussion. That was a great frame and I might borrow it, Laura, <laughs> for the rest of the conversation. Dario, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your work at CCI. Hi, everyone. Uh, really excited to be here uh, on this panel. Um, like Kaylin said, I'm uh, Dario Tarborelli and the program officer for the uh, um, fairly recently created open science program at the John Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, CCI is probably the youngest among the philanthropic organizations represented here. So we're gonna give you a few, a few words uh, uh, to describe what we're doing. Um, so CCI is um, comprised of two, three different uh, initiatives and I'm part of the CCI science initiative. And the CCI Science Initiative has its mission to invest into science and technology to make it possible to prevent, manage, or cure all disease by the end of the century. That's a pretty high bar, uh, but we believe that there's been a lot of progress uh, um, in the just a span of decades, uh, where by combining like, grant making with building tools and technology to advance research, uh, there's a lot we can do um, in that space. So practically speaking, CCI science organized as a, a somewhat um, un, uncommonly as a, a tech organization. So half of the organization builds technology and the other half is a pretty traditional philanthropic organization. And across um, the two organizations, so we have a, a variety of projects uh, that broadly fall under the umbrella of um, uh, open infrastructure for science. And we've invested uh, uh, over the past uh, five years now um, into several platforms and open source tools that enable open collaboration, rapid dissemination, and reproducibility for science. There are some of these um, infrastructure investments that um, are in um, like scientifically focused programs. Uh, one example is the Human Cell Atlas. It's driven by the uh, Single Cell Biology Program at CCI. Um, it's a project that we uh, contribute to that aims to map and characterize uh, all cells in a, in a healthy human body um, as a resource, as an open resource uh, to advance a uh, study of uh, health and disease. And we contribute to the project uh, uh, in a variety of formats through the development of like technical tools, like a data coordination platform for reconciling and structuring, cleaning up all the data through serious comp uh, computational tools built on top of that, um, but also through grants, through grants that try and advance uh, uh, new methods in single cell biology to, to contribute to this, um, to this platform. Uh, and we have similar examples uh, in other um, um, scientific programs that we that we drive, such as the imaging technology, which is a new direction that we're uh, we're building at CCI, focused on building the uh, infrastructure, methods, computational tooling, and community around uh, open imaging technology. But when it comes to the open science uh, program, the one that I run, um, I want to give you a few examples of uh, the kind of work that we're doing. Um, so we believe that some of the biggest uh, advances in science have been made possible when infrastructure exists that enables large-scale collaboration and large-scale coordination of multiple groups to really coalesce around uh, uh, the same problem and uh, work on uh, related problems using standard workflows and replicable practices in the open. And as part of the open science portfolio, we've been working uh, with a number of partners to advance this vision and just to mention a few of the areas we're currently working on, um, uh, we are uh, one of the major funders uh, of two preprint repositories. So CCI supports a bioarchive and MedArchive. Uh, we support platforms for sharing of uh, open methods and protocols like protocols.io. Emma uh, was here and, and spoke earlier uh, today. Um, and we also have a, a program to support uh, um, open source for science. Um, and this is probably the one example that is not traditionally part of infrastructure, but I like to, to consider as, a, as an interesting uh, way of characterizing um, the notion of uh, infrastructure for science as a collection of tools that become indispensable for researchers. So yeah, looking forward to telling you more about uh, how we see the problem of open infrastructure. That's a short summary of uh, what we're doing at CCI. 
Thank you, Dario. Um, Patricia, I'd love to hear from you next as, you know, not only knowing the, the shifts in the portfolio name from scholarly communications to public knowledge and also Mellon's, uh, Mellon's work in funding infrastructure. So floor is yours. Um, thanks, Caitlin. Uh, so as Caitlin mentioned earlier, I am the program officer for public knowledge at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And our program did used to be the scholarly communications program. Um, you may know that the Mellon Foundation funds primarily in the arts and humanities. Um, but nonetheless, infrastructure is very important to those areas. And um, as the public knowledge program, we tend to focus um, on um, needs in the humanities. So in June of this year, the Mellon Foundation announced its new strategic framework um, to support grant making through a social justice lens, hence the name change. Um, and while the scholarly communications program was primarily focused on academic libraries and archives, as well as scholarly presses, I think public knowledge, well, actually it's not even I think, I know public knowledge will be more focused on a broader array of libraries and archives. And by that, I mean public libraries um, uh, tribal libraries, possibly um, not only scholarly presses, but you know we're interested in in um, possibly supporting grassroots presses. So um, and then archives, not only that are in higher education institutions, but um, community-based archives, for example. So um, in that way, our shift, I think it. It um, sounds that it's much more public, obviously, than um, the scholarly communications program was. We're aware that in supporting the academic libraries um, and archives uh, to develop open source tools and platforms and infrastructure, there have been certain kinds of institutions um, that have or have had the resources to stand up those things. So increasingly, we're asking who has not been a part of the user base for these kinds of technologies? who's not been involved in developing those technologies as a result. Um, what, how do we um, make ec more equitable the access to this infrastructure, both in terms of the use of it and in terms of the development of it? Um, we're also aware that we have funded innovative technology um, as you know, my colleagues here have in the last um, decade or more. And while it has effectively enabled an almost end-to-end digital research workflow for the humanities from digitization to OCR to encoding to um, image operability to citation management. Um, we haven't been as intentionally, I would say, ambitious or strategic about maintenance and sustainability of that infrastructure um, and of the platforms and tools um, that are included in that infrastructure. So um, that's going to be a main aim. That is a main aim of the public knowledge program. And so I'll just list basically the three things, the three main areas that we're, commi we're committed to. We are committed to establishing and strengthening interdependent networks and services for exposing and sharing hidden or little known information resources and collections. That's somewhat resonant with um, what Laura has mentioned. We are committed to ensuring the authenticity and value of original sources in the process of documenting and preserving them in all formats, including web-based content with focus on materials from historically underrepresented cultures and populations, still very humanities focused. We are also committed to maintaining and improving the technology tools and infrastructure needed to ensure that the public can readily access knowledge resources related to the foundation's social justice orientation. And I will stop there. I won't be, get too specific in projects that'll probably come up in the conversation we have shortly. Thank you, Patricia. Oh, so many, so many fun things. I'm furiously taking notes. Michael, over to you. Can you hear me? The mute's, oh, there we go. Hi everyone. Uh, thanks for thanks for having me. Um, so yes, uh, uh, as was mentioned, I'm Michael Brennan. I'm a program officer on the technology and society team at Ford Foundation. And similar to Patricia's foundation, we also have a social justice focus. Our entire organizing issue is around addressing the drivers of inequality around the world, and we do that through a number of programs, whether it comes to workers' rights or criminal justice reform or the or the arts. Um, on the technology and society team. One of our largest areas of focus is simply the internet. And um, you know, a quote that I love from Darren Walker, our president, is he talks about you know our desire to have a just society and how you can't have a just society without a just internet because society is based on the internet. So we've had a long 
uh, lasting portfolio focused on internet policy issues. You know, we're working on a lot of things like net neutrality, data privacy, surveillance reform, all of these issues. That's gone back quite a ways. But when I came to the foundation, I was asked to uh, build out a complement to that portfolio, a complement to that, that that strategy that focused on focuses on the infrastructure of an equitable internet, of an internet that is open that is open to everyone. And um, I'm just going to drill down into a few ways in which we've interpreted that and work on that, and then I'll stop so we can get into get into our discussion. So it was a big kind of question to think like, how does a social justice foundation start thinking about infrastructure on the internet? And there's three main areas that we ultimately found that we felt like we had a meaningful contribution to make and, and, a, and a voice to have and grant making to do. One is thinking about the new civil society institutions that a fair and just internet relies upon from an infrastructure perspective. And I think a great example of one of these institutions is the Internet Security Research Group, which runs the Let's Encrypt project. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Let's Encrypt project, Every single website you go to where you see that lock symbol up on your address bar, uh, there's a whole bunch of math in a thing called a digital certificate that you're required to get for that lock. And if you want to run a secure website, you need to get that certificate. Let's Encrypt is a nonprofit free certificate authority that's fundamentally changed the underlying security of the internet. About 30 something percent of all web pages were secure about five years ago. Now it's over 85%, maybe over 90 at this point, largely due to the disruption that Let's Encrypt has had in this space. So a great example of a new nonprofit institution fundamentally changing the underlying infrastructure of the internet. The second area that we look at is open source. So we know that open source code is a modern public good that we all rely upon, but uh, is often under-maintained or, or uh, underfunded under, and, and often unsustainable. So we've been funding uh, a few projects, including a multi-foundation partnership on funding research into the public interest implications of open source infrastructure. And we're now in our second uh, round of that. We're gonna announce a whole, a slate of new grantees in the new year in partnership with Sloan Foundation, uh, Omidyar Network, Mozilla uh, and Open Society Foundations. And finally, the, the last place that we look at is uh, the standards and design of an open internet. So, you know, the protocols that we rely upon, like the IP protocol, which is like the base protocol that we use just for computers to be talking to each other. These are things that are decided on and have been decided for decades at international bodies that are largely made up of private tech companies and governments. And while it's important to have those groups at the table, the group that's been underrepresented in these places has largely been civil society, people that are exclusively representing the public interests and thinking about what's good for all of us. How do we make a more secure internet by default? How do we make a more privacy preserving internet by default? And how do we advocate for that in the absence of corporate or government uh, interests so that we can have meaningful kind of collective conversations with those with those groups and come to a consensus that supports everyone. And we support groups like Article 19's Team Digital, like the ACLU and their internet infrastructure position, like the Center for Democracy and Technology, all who have played really critical roles in building a network of public interest actors at these in these spaces. Um, so you know the public interest voice can be heard. Um, there's a lot more to internet infrastructure that we that we don't touch upon because we only have so many hours and, 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 and dollars. Uh, but I do also want to call the fact that we've had a renewed focus this year on broadband access as an emerging part of our work. We've uh, not traditionally done a lot of work in the physical endpoint of access for the internet. Uh, but I think the COVID pandemic this year in particular has really demonstrated how important it is uh, to, to increase our role in that. And um, while I can't speak to that deeply right now, uh, I, I want to note that it's an important part of our work. So I'll stop there and uh, look forward to the conversation. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and as I noted in the chat, please feel free to add some questions. I've got some here that I'll um, get started with. Oh, and we have one from Danielle to kick things off. Um, Danielle would love to know about the longer term vision for open scholarship and digital infrastructure. Where do you want the sector to go in terms of collaboration, independence, sustainability? And I'll open it up to see which one of you want to chime in first. Patricia, you look you look eager to hit that unmute button now. <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm eager. Um, I, I, what I, I, I find Danielle's question um, compelling because we've only sort of, you know, um, started to think about 
uh, maintenance and sustainability. I mean, in, much more um, strategically than than previously. So I was looking at that question. I was thinking, oh my gosh, I wonder what um, the other three panelists would say. Um, and so I I I think that we're kind of on the cusp of you know trying to figure that out. And the ten year is a is a ten year you know vision really what we what would be useful here, maybe a five year um, incremental um, kind of vision, just because things change so fast. Um, and, but I can also see that there's the question of where do you want to be in 10 years? Um, and so one answer for that uh, for me would be, I wanna see in 10 years, I hope that in 10 years um, that we already, we know like, you know, um, uh, it's automatic um, how we're going to sustain technologies that are continually in use and that have a robust user base, that that's not going to be a question. And it's not going to be a question that um, institutions will support that, will fund that, like maintenance and sustainability will be built in as, um, as cost, um, cost items or line items or cost structures, I guess. So that's one, one um, offering that I have to that question. I'll um, add to that, uh, first on the, on, the, on the collaboration bit, one of the most exciting things to me is, uh, uh, in, the, in the funding space is I actually think that the most fruitful, enjoyable, and like well-intentioned collaborations I've had have been with folks, some of the folks on this panel and with other folks thinking about this infrastructure aspect of things. I, I think there's a number of organizations that are kind of coming to this saying like, hey, this is important and it's, it's not a huge group. So we're all looking to each other for kind of support and guidance and advice. And um, it's been really, Really cool to see, uh, and then for me at least on the on the on the ten year uh, line of things, you know, I feel like I've learned so much being at. I come from a computer science background. I've learned so much from being at Ford Foundation about what the long term goals are, and I, I think my general goal is really about building power and building power for public interest advocates in these spaces that have often that has often been lacking, so that these institutions can long outlive any of the strategies that we're building so that we can we can rest easy knowing that there are well-sustained, well-managed institutions advocating exclusively for the public interest and have the power behind them that their voices are heard and, and, and listened to. Yeah, I'll um, kind of build on that. I mean, I, my, I think initial reaction to the question was similar to Patricia in that like, oh my God, what is gonna happen in 10 years? I mean, just thinking about 10 years ago, like this is not the world I guess we could have anticipated. So I, I feel like we tend to sort of, and I, I think also kind of going through a lot of the exercises we did to build our you know, multidimensional framework, just recognizing that the definition of what we consider to be critical infrastructure and critical pieces of society changes and it's changing more rapidly as time moves on. So we do need these moments to kind of like rethink what are the structures and paradigms that we want. And so I think for me, kind of the response to the question would be more about like, what are those values that we want to build into whatever it's going to look like? And, you know, sustainability was mentioned, building power, um, especially within the public sector was mentioned. I mean, I think for us too, it's like, you know, thinking through, um, you know, how do we appropriately, um, you know, think about who uh, is responsible for the governance and for the costing? Because right now it seems like there's, you know, that's kind of like a hodgepodge of things that have sort of developed organically over time. But as they become more and more critical, you know, we need to think about the kind of world that we want and kind of build backwards from there. So I think, yeah, again, just, you know, figuring out how to how to keep our own learnings and our own, um, you know, governance and funding up to, you know, whatever the, the times calls for. Yeah, and I'll jump in to say that our, our North Star in the Open Science Program at CCI is universal access to all knowledge and outputs in, uh, in research that can advance uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the endeavors that we're trying to support towards curing and managing all disease. That's a really tall bar uh, by the century. And I think what we'd like to get to um, in the next uh, five, 10 years is a point in which the way in which researchers and institutions uh, and all the different components of researchers, not limited to scientists, but also research engineers uh, and um, advocates uh, of, uh, of science uh, when it comes to the interface with the public, um, have access to the best possible um, tools for uh, working in the open and collaborating uh, at scale. Uh, I think it's something we've seen this year just being, at least for my own uh, portfolio and experience, just transformative is to see how the pandemic has literally um, has literally moved people to abandon, you know, some of the typical norms about uh, 
career progression and what you need to do and just uh, pooling all these resources and all the attention on platforms and practices that can dramatically accelerate uh, the throughput of science through open data, um, shared tooling, shared infrastructure, um, shared platforms for sharing results as early as possible uh, and building collaborative structures on top of that. Um, so the, the work that I dream of that I hope we can contribute to in the next five, 10 years is one in, in which this large scale collaboration that happens in the open um, fueled by this uh, different piece of infrastructure becomes the norm and not the exception to how we do uh, research in biomedicine. Thank you for that. Um, so we've got a number of questions coming up in the chat and I will try to answer as many as I possibly can, but I wanna take a, a moment and kind of pick up on a couple of threads that you've all mentioned, especially when we talk about 10 years, which seems like a really long period of time, given that this feels like the longest nine months or 12 months of my lifetime. Um, but also thinking about when we think uh, through maintenance, and I know that that's a really complicated element that a number of us are kind of turning over. When we think about maintaining or sustaining current infrastructure, and also Patricia, thinking about your comments of the the broader um, inequities that we know that we're kind of grappling with now, um, how do you balance that tension of wanting to, you know, sort of maintain the infrastructure that we have, but also recognizing and being, you know, to Laura, to your point about 10 years being a long time, being responsive or you know, still allowing for that opportunity for it to evolve and change and not lock in potentially the ways of the past. Take, I take that, I suppose. Um, sure. <laughs> yeah. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, well, I guess my, uh, you know, one of the things that our executive director likes to say is sort of our um, model of philanthropy is sustainable society's R&D. So, you know, figuring out like, mm. where are the gaps and how do we, how do we think about filling those gaps and then kind of allowing, um, you know, the users of those products to decide or to, you know, kind of see what moves forward. I mean, I think another thing too, is like we as funders, and I think all of us on this call, you know, this applies to all of us are, you know, trying to sort of be really responsive to the field and kind of you know, understand what folks need. And so it is kind of like, we're constantly in conversation with, you know, people who are, are using the various tools and products, but people who have ideas who are, who are um, sort of spotlighting gaps. And so it's, it really is kind of um, a give and take, I think, when it comes to that. So that tension is inherent and will always be there. But I think at least for us, like the way that we approach it is like, you know, when there, where there are gaps, like what can we test? How can we fill them? I can jump on and say a few words about how we're currently tackling the question of maintenance. Um, we're just uh, at the end of uh, the first year of this new program to support uh, what we call essential open source software for science. And the program was precisely designed and actually building on you know, work that uh, Mike at Ford and then uh, Josh at Sloan Foundation and others have done for years to try and think of what can be done to support those activities that have traditionally been really, really hard to fund. And in the context of scientific open source, that typically, typically boils down to you know, community management, supporting onboarding of, uh, of new contributors, building inclusive spaces for especially those underrepresented voices that would contribute to making these software products uh, really fulfilling their vision of serving uh, the, the broadest possible population, broadest possible audience. And these are typically activities that are not fundable through your usual research grant, uh, uh, governmental or uh, federal, uh, federal grant. And so we tried to build this program, uh, which I think became like particularly um, urgent in the context of a pandemic where we're like, okay, some of the, some of the critical research that uh, we need to conduct in order to address some of the biggest challenges uh, for humankind, critically depend, depends on the set of tools um, that just uh, everybody, everybody's happening to use at the moment. How do we make sure that we can so like, uh, resource these, um, uh, these groups with um, not so much funding for doing new things, not so much funding for building new features, uh, uh, driving new um, research-oriented functionality, which is something that's already well supported by governmental uh, funders, but really with resources to take care of all these aspects uh, that are so critical for their success. Um, and so the way we, the way uh, 
the way we like to think about uh, about maintenance and funding new things for supporting existing things. Um, I, I think we have a, as a as a fund as funders, we have a responsibility to think about uh, what exists out there and um, sort of like think about the balance between funding new things versus funding the existing and seeing what are the uh, what what is the impact we can have by uh, supporting what exists and bringing new energy and funneling new resources into what exists uh, as opposed to spinning up new initiatives? Yeah, if I could just add one thing, um, we've been talking about maintenance maintenance and sustainability of infrastructure and. One um, thing that I um, didn't mention, but that we are uh, keen to help understand is financial health. So sustainability, actual financial sustainability of an organization. And um, one initiative that we started um, at the end of last year is with the nonprofit fund, uh, which put out a call to those organizations that are important to digital scholarship and digital preservation, basically, um, you know, also the digital humanities um, world to see, um, you know, what organizations need that um, help, basically need help developing um, change capital. Because a lot of the time, you know, you have these membership based organizations that are, you know, they grow, they grow through the membership. They also grow in terms of scale and um, number of people working, number of technologies being produced, but there isn't always enough attention to how they can change and improve and grow. And so this grant um, is basically about that. And it's been interesting to hear that one of the challenges is um, having boards, boards of these organizations. So the governance structures understand what change, cap what change capital needs and what um, and sort of the technical um, understanding and technical education behind financial health. Um, so I think increasingly that's going to be something that we want to help the sector, the sector that you know matters um, for us in the humanities to be able to to do is understand financial sustainability as well as sustainability and maintenance of technology and infrastructure. Is it okay if I, I blend this a little bit with one of the questions I saw in the chat? Okay. Absolutely, go for it. Um, so I saw that question about like, how do you how do you maintain the funding, the funding or interest in the space when like the interest fades because infrastructure is kind of a hot topic right now. I, I think it kind of comes back to this question of, of maintenance as well. Um, I, I, will, I mean, I think everyone here has done a good job of ensuring this stuff gets cemented in their institutions. I think that's been a big part of what I'm thinking about it for too. It's like, how do I ensure that the consideration of this issue outlasts my time. Like at Ford, for example, we only have eight, eight year terms. So I have, I have three years off of my term, which is great job security more than most could ask for, but also means that like, I want this work to continue to continue past that and actually like look for opportunities to integrate these perspectives into written strategies, getting buy-in from leadership at the top and helping people really fully realize and understand how much we rely upon these things that have been kind of hidden hidden for so long. So I think that's part of the work of being a funder. It's not just about deciding who gets grants. It's about trying to integrate a long-term vision into your institution and into a field, I think, I think, I think more broadly. And that's kind of part of what I think about on the maintenance front too. No, thank you for that. And I know we could probably have this conversation for another additional hour, but we only have 11 minutes left. So I'm gonna to try to crank through as many as possible. Um, one of the questions that I wanted to, um, that I wanted to ask this group, which I know Dara, you kind of chimed in a little bit here too, um, is about the free rider problem being addressed in open infrastructure and how you're seeing that be addressed or maybe not be addressed in funding models and, and what work needs to be done. Uh yeah, so again, like, give like some immediate thoughts. This is something I've been thinking a lot about, both here at CCI, but also previously at Wikimedia. Um, you know, we've seen like the uh, siphoning and reuse of uh, Wikipedia data to power the tech industry without necessarily giving back to a sustainable project. Uh, or another more relevant example of what we're doing right now at CCI, we've seen like the adoption and extension of Jupyter-based um, notebook technology by major corporate cloud computing providers such as Microsoft, Google, and Amazon that very often like embrace and extend and don't contribute back to the original project. So um, that is, a, I think, a fundamental problem we all need to uh, think about as we, uh, as we think about the impact of, uh, of open infrastructure. And I, I think in some cases, it's okay for this infrastructure to, uh, to seed 
um, efforts that are both, you know, nonprofit and community driven as well as a uh, corporate and for profit. Um, but I think we also need to think about models that allow this infrastructure to, so like, a, well, that allow to lock open these projects. Uh, one of my favorite projects uh, uh, that I've been presenting here is a uh, um, paywall by our research. And I think that model of creating, um, initially philanthropically funded, in, uh, philanthropically funded initiative that uh, manages to create a, a key dependency for an entire ecosystem that is based on open data, open source, uh, um, and a nonprofit model, um, and then become more sustainable through services and contracts. I think that is a one way of addressing the problem of uh, avoiding the free problem, like making sure that we, we we lock we lock open these dependencies and and they become sustainable in, in the long run. Okay. And if someone else wants to jump in, please feel free. Otherwise, I can hop to some of these other questions, see how many more we can, can answer on that. Sounds good. Um, so one of the questions that was asked at the top um, top of our discussion from Lisa Inchliff was, how are funders assessing the success of their program investments? So what makes you say that was a good investment? Mike. We measure everything. No, I'm kidding. We don't, we don't do any deep you know, constant measurement. Um, you know, it's a really good question. And I think the answer that you're probably gonna hate is that my first off the cuff answer is it depends. Like it depends a lot on what the outcomes of a specific project or goal is. And, and I'm really curious to hear what others say, I'll, I'll just drop in a, a couple of things. And these are not by no means exhaustive, they're just examples. I think, you know, one thing way we think about work is about, like I mentioned earlier, building power and, and strengthening institutions. It's like, are we creating uh, by through this grant, are we creating an organization or supporting an individual that can be responsive over the long term, that can have a voice, that can that can bring forward a message and see, uh, you know, others respond respond to it. So it's less about the kind of like metrics you put in a proposal, like we want to get this many publications out or reach this many people, and it's more like, what is the state of this entity? At the end of the grant, compared to the beginning, are they on a are they on a path? Are they are they respected in the field? Are they building a network? Um, are they are other grantees that you know and have good relationships taking notice of them? It's about like that. I'm, I guess I'm trying to articulate the soft areas of like field building and institution building that we often look for in grants. Um, there are many kind of grants that might have different metrics, but I'll throw that out there as as one one that we do, we do look at. Yeah, I'm gonna give, I, I would give sort of like the same kind of annoying answer was like the it depends answer, just because there are so many different goals for different types of grants. There's innovating funds, sustaining funds, these movement building funds, there's, we have a whole, um, a whole body of work around inquiry funds. Like what are we learning alongside grants? Like how do we pull out those learnings? So I think it really depends on what the goal is, but I think one of the things too, just that, you know, just kind of looking at, you know, organizational health, like did we leave the organization in a better position to achieve their own goals, however they wanted to find them at the end of the grant and at the beginning and like how do we again support them um, in whatever their goals are and you know a lot of you know well, a big conversation that's you know always been a conversation I feel like it's happening more and more now too is like what does sustainability look like I mean there's it's one thing to have um, you know philanthropic uh, organizations fund forever but I, you know there is something to be said for finding um, or, you know or for securing alternative sources of funding, it's just a different type of value. It's like, what kind of value do we place on the body of work that's you know being produced by these organizations? So um, again, I think I'm gonna kind of like default to my line about sort of like the R&D, but you know, how do we help um, organizations get to the type of sustainability that they're seeking so they don't have to be so dependent? So there are diverse like revenue streams. So there is like a really stable, um, stable uh, organizational structure and organizational health and whatnot. So I think it's probably the balance of, of all of those things, which again is my, uh, very long way to way of saying that there's no there's no right answer. <laughs> I'll just add um, that I think we're also wanting to know what does um, success and uh, you know mean for the grantee themselves, for the organization um, themselves, and making sure that their their understanding of what a good investment is aligns with you know our understanding and if we are wanting to help those who are much less resourced than we have helped in the past that could you know be a different kind of um uh, assessment, or that could be a different kind of understanding of investment. So this is something that, you know, we're sort of internally 
um, uh, wanting to understand better and that it will, you know, we will um, understand better as we make these new um, types of grants and go in this new direction. Okay, so we've got about five minutes left. I do want to sneak in a question. We have a question from uh, a colleague in Australia about international collaboration. I know everyone here is reflective of a US funder, um, but thinking about how we can maximize that international collaboration, um, especially with the idea that these initiatives in their direction are not just driven from US or Europe. I would love to know what sort of considerations you're um, undertaking or, or where you think there's some additional work to do to think about that on an international level. I you know I just started the last question, but I want to jump in quick here because this has been something that's been really top of mind for us, for example, on this open source research initiative that we've done. And you can learn a bit about this initiative if you're interested at fordfoundation.org slash digital infrastructure. That's just as like our open source initiative. Um, with our first round, we had 13 grantees. Every single one of them was from United States, uh, Europe, or Australia. Or their next round, well, I don't have the, the I can't share the details yet, about 40% of them are based in the Gulf of South. And that was representative of an intentional effort on our part in a variety of fronts of intentionally trying to build our own networks in, in, in regions that we don't have as much connection to and recognizing the very disproportionate balance of who's involved in some of the most technical bits that, that we rely upon and how uh, US centric they tend to be, how male centric and white centric they, they, they tend to be. And I think intentionally trying to broaden our our own networks and our own work and and working with others to kind of to, to, to diversify that diversify our reach I also think comes to you as a funder you have to start thinking about what you assume about who comes to you and what support they may need in terms of developing that work like if we only funded the objectively best proposals that sounded the best on paper, we'd probably be funding only like, you know, Ivy League schools, like people that have the resources, institutional resources to support people to kind of have, they have a fundraising team and they have a development team. They can put these things, put these things together. As a funder, when you're on the other end, it's really imperative, it's, an, it's our imperative, I think, to, to look deeper and, and think about the, the privileges that some folks have in coming to us and what others don't have and extend our own time and energy and resources so that when an organization comes along that maybe doesn't have you know the fundraising team that Harvard does to like polish their proposal you're not trying to compare apples to apples when you know that like you know that you're talking about a two-person organization that's never been funded by a major foundation versus an organization with a multi-billion dollar endowment that's been doing this for decades so those are just like some things but I think there's a strong global dynamic that plays out in that aspect of, of funding. I'm nodding furiously, and I wish we could dig into that a bit longer. Um, I know we are almost at the top of the hour, so I do want to give um, our panelists um, an opportunity to kind of say, you know, one kind of wrap up remark. Um, if there's something to kind of go into the rest of Jay Rost um, for our participants, uh, or something that gives you hope looking into 2021 when it comes to digital, public, open infrastructure, however you want to define it. Um, Laura, you're on the far right of my screen. I'll start with you. <laughs> Um, well, I guess my hope is just that, can it be as bad as 2020? Um, but no, <laughs> I guess uh, just my closing thoughts, the thing I've been particularly mulling on this week, even though it's only Tuesday night, it feels like this week is as long as this year, but um, it's just that like, there's sort of like a couple of um, like realms of problem, like problem spaces maybe isn't the exact right word, but just like when we think about like how to fund digital public infrastructure, open infrastructure, whatever terms we wanna use, it's like part of philosophical problem. Like how do we come to value it as a society? It's, it's part of communications problem. It's like, how do we communicate to people that it's important to them, that it's important to their institutions, that it's important to like our government, it's important to funders, which is like a comms problem. And then there's logistical problems, which I think is kind of, um, you know, it, that's the solution sort of in the field. And I think a lot of times, like we sort of get tripped up on solving the logistical problems, but we also need to recognize that there are these two deeper problems, which I think everyone on this call sort of like intuits, but it's not the, the broad norm. And so I think just recognizing that there are these spheres that we need to influence like all at the same time and like juggle a lot of things as we move forward, um, just helps kind of sort out like who's doing their piece of the puzzle and like makes us more effective collaborators. And so I just like offer that as a way to, um, you know, think and, and work with each other moving forward. Thank you, Patricia. 
Um, I think the, the thing I would leave with is um, the scale, uh, the concept of scale. Um, it's something that I've been thinking about because um, we all want to be able to um, provide the broadest possible um, populace or community with um, you know, the infrastructure that they need. But at the same time, um, there are certain things that we're starting to fund that I'm not sure would scale. And I'm not sure that that would be in the best interest of the community for, um, for a certain type of tool or platform or even um, uh, archival holdings, let's say, um, to scale. So that's one thing. And then another thing that I'll leave with is we haven't talked a, uh, much about, and I, you know, it's totally understandable about climate change and the effect that that is gonna have obviously on infrastructure and maintenance and sustainability. But it is something that um, our program is thinking about and trying to understand what are some of the um, best ways that we can start to support or address that problem for um, the humanities and for libraries, archives, and presses. Thank you so much. Dario, over to you. Yeah, my closing thoughts, um... Like also reacting to something that was being discussed in the in the chat is that um, especially when I think about open science, uh, open science is like by and large uh, white male and northern uh, uh, or western um, endeavor. I know there are some amazing leaders that don't come from that demographic, but it's like if you look at the open the voices and if it's open science, it's like pretty much that kind of demographic. And like one of the things that I that I think we need to work on as we're building capacity uh, for uh, groups that are doing excellent work and need to receive funding and support is one, help them better navigate uh, the space of uh, philanthropic support. This is something that we hear over and over from folks outside of our network. Um, even when our network extends globally, like uh, CZI at the moment funds um, a research and infrastructure projects like globally. And we have like a, uh, many initiatives across all continents, but making sure we can, um, reduce the barriers uh, to access our program officers uh, and our programs uh, when there are projects that are that are valued that are getting traction. Um, that's one of the first things that I, I think we, we need to do. And also when we're talking about uh, open science infrastructure that's designed to create a level playing field for, uh, for folks to participate, we do a lot of work uh, around the landscaping of preprints uh, really trying to think about like what are the voices that are not uh, that are not heard when you look at the prioritization of user stories and trying to figure out how you can design for for the margins and um, and put them at the center of uh, your your open science goals because uh, um, that should really be what open science is for. Beautifully said. And Michael, last but not least. Um, I guess my closing thought is just someone once told me, and I think it's very true, that the way the way to a funder's heart is through their grantees. I would say if anyone here is on the, on this call has relationships with funders, people that fund you, but maybe they don't fund this part of your work, make sure you tell them about it anyway. I think that's been one of the most effective ways to get new funders to realize about the work in in, in other spaces. So that's a that'd be my my small call to action. And and thank you all for for inviting us, and it's been great to be on the panel with all of you.